Number 35, what is 60% of 40? So 60% can be written as 0.6 or 60 over 100. You can decide how you'll figure that out. So I'm going to choose 0.6 of means times 40. So 60% of 40, 0.6 times 40, 0.6 times 40. Then you'll just go over on your scratch paper and write that out. 6 times 0 is 0, 6 times 4 is 24. Count back to your decimal points, 1, and then the decimal point on the 40 is there so you can't go back anymore so one so one your decimal point goes right after the 24 so 24 is your answer 24 is 60 percent of 40. 36 write the percent formula in the box this is something you'll just have to memorize for percent um, problems and that is percent times whole equals the part. Percent times whole equals part. Thirty-seven asks, fifteen is sixty percent of what number? This is where your percent formula comes in handy. You're just going to plug in fifteen is sixty percent of what number? Plug it into your percent formula. So I went ahead and wrote out my percent formula, and now we're just going to plug in the number where it's appropriate. So 60% here would go under the percent. The whole number we don't know. Recall that I told you the whole number typically comes after the word of. So because it comes after the word of, and they're asking what of what number, we don't know the whole number. So that's our unknown. So we can just name whole w. And part of our whole number is the 15. So 15 is what part of 60%? So 15 is 60% of what number? Then our part is going to be 15. Now we'll change our 60% to 0 0.6 or 60 over 100. So 0 0.6 times W equals 15. I'm going to join my 0 0.6 and my W because they're times. So 0 0.6 W equals 15. Now at this point, you can say 0 0.6 times what equals 15. That's a little more difficult. So I would just divide through by negative that by I'm sorry by 0.6. I'm going to move over here to give a little more space. I know I didn't allow for enough space. So 0.6 w equals 15. I'm going to divide through by 0.6 on both sides. My 0.6s cancel out and now I have W equals 15 divided by 0.6, allowing for more room. So 15 divided by 0.6. I can't have a decimal in my divisor, so I'm going to move it over 1 to give me a whole number of 6, and but I have to move another um, place value and put in 150. Hopefully you guys all know how to do that by now. So I'm just going to rewrite that. 6 goes into 15 two times. 6 goes into 30 five times. So what is 15 or 15 is 60% of what number? 15 is 60% of 25. 38, how many questions did the student get right on the test that had 20 questions if his score was 70%? So we know that this test had a total of 20 questions and he scored 70%. We're going to need to write out our percent formula again. Percent times whole equals part. Our percent is 70%. I'm going to translate that to 0.7. 
times our whole, which is 20 questions. This te test had a total of 20 questions, and we do not know the part. We don't know what he got right yet, or what the student, how he, um, how many he or she got right. So let's go ahead and multiply 0. 0.7 times 20 is 14. If you multiply that out, so total he got right is 14. For 39 and 40, I just said for 439 and 40, um, kind of as a fun, some fun questions, I guess. I put the songs that we sang earlier on in the year um, about having the same signs in your expression or your equation. So what that means is when you are adding or subtracting um, in algebra, if you have two of the same signs, a negative and a negative, you are going to follow a certain rule. And if your signs are different, like these are the same, these are different, you're also going to follow a different rule. So I went ahead and wrote out um, what is in, what's supposed to be in those blanks there. So for same signs, you will sing, I'm not going to sing it, well maybe I will, same signs, add in, keep different signs, subtract, keep the sign of the greater number, then you'll be exact. Okay, so I gave an example here that you will do on your final. So these are the same signs, so you add them, 9 plus 9 is 18, and you keep the sign. So you keep the sign, and you simply add 9 plus 9. So negative 9 minus 9 is negative 18. For number 40a, you have different signs. So the rule is different signs subtract. So 9 minus 9 is 0. Keep the sign of the greater number, then you'll be exact. So negative 9 plus 9 is 0. They cancel each other out. Number 41 through 45 will be graphing inequalities. So number 41 says x is greater than 3. So find your 3 on the number line and it's greater than three. So it doesn't equal three, it's everything that's greater than three. So you're gonna have an open point, an open circle, and then everything that's greater to the right will be your line. So an open point and a line with an arrow. So X is greater than three infinitely greater than 3. It just keeps going. 42, x is less than 2. So it's less than 2. It doesn't equal 2. So you're going to have an open point and it's going to be everything that's less than 2. So your line will go like that with an arrow to the left. 43, x is greater or equal to 5. So it's equal, find your 5, it's equal to 5. So you're going to have a closed point, and it's everything that's greater than 5. So everything to the right with an arrow. 44, same thing, x is less than negative 4 or I'm sorry, x is less than or equal to negative 4. So you're going to find negative 4 on your number line. And it's equal to negative 4 as well. So you're going to have a closed point and everything that is less than to the left with an arrow. 45, x does not equal negative 2. These I always think are fun. So find your negative 2 and x cannot equal negative 2. So you're going to have an open point, but it equals everything else on the, the number line, both negative 
and positive. So your arrows are going to go to the right and also to the left of your open point. But it cannot equal negative 2, so that needs to just stay open. Number 46 says write an equation for the following word phrase. Solve to find the first and second integer. So our word phrase says the sum of two consecutive integers is 25. So let's look at this word phrase. The sum of two consecutive integers is 25. So is, let's start with the end there, is, oops, boy, what's wrong with me? Is 25 equals 25. Now let's look at everything after is. Okay, so everything after is. The sum. We know that sum means to add. So we have a plus sign. Two consecutive integers. So let's name our first integer n. Okay, and if we wanted a consecutive integer or a number that comes right after n, let's pretend our number is 1 and we wanted the next number, which would be 2, we'd have to add 1. So our first integer is going to be n, like this. Our next integer is going to be n plus 1. So first integer, second integer, n plus 1. So the sum of two consecutive integers, n plus n, the first integer plus the second integer n plus n plus 1 equals 25. That's our equation. And then our first, oh, so we're going to solve. So we're going to solve here. n plus n is 2n plus 1 equals 25. Then I'm going to subtract 1 on both sides to get n by itself. That gives me 24. 2n equals 24. And solve this mentally. 2 times what is 24? 2 times 12 is 24. So n equals 13. Oh, I'm sorry. n equals 12. I just said that. And then if I were to substitute my n for 12, 12 plus 1 is 13. So my second integer, and it's consecutive, meaning right after, one after the other, 13. Number 47 um, use the distributive properties to d d use the distributive property to solve for n. So remember, you're going to distribute four into both two n. You're going to multiply, and then next you're going to distribute four or times uh, four times negative five. So four times two n. Oops, just ignore that little red mark. 4 times 2n is 8n. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. See how I did that? 4 times 2n is 8n. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. Equals 20. I need to get n all by itself, so I'm going to subtract that negative 20. Or I'm sorry, I'm going to add 20 to cancel it out. And then I'm going to add 20 to the other side because what I do to one side, I have to do the other to balance out the equation. So 40, 8n equals 40. We can solve this mentally here. 8 times what is 40? 8 times 5. So n equals 5. So n equals 5. You can just put 5 in the box. The next one. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have written so. Okay, so the next one, 2n plus 3 equals 6n minus 1. So I'm going to use that distributive property again. 2 times n, I'm just going to draw the little arrows again. And then 6 times n, and 6 times negative 1. 2 times n is 2n. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 times n is 6n. 6 times a negative 1 is a negative 6. For this equation, you will see that you have variables on both sides. Okay, And don't fret because 
all you need to do is combine these two like terms together and then these constants will be linked together as well. So I always want to, I don't always have to, but I, I'll always want to put my variable on the left side, okay? I mean, you could move this to n because it's a, it's a smaller number. Um, that's what I might do, but just for the sake of what the book says to do, move variables to the left. Um, let's just do, let's just do that. So I'm going to subtract 6n on both sides. And this is going to cancel out those right there. It looks like I wrote a division bar, but um, let's just subtract 6n. That cancels out. I subtract 6n from over here too. Negative 6n plus 2n is a negative 4n. Okay, I'm going to move all my constants to the right. These numbers alone are called constants. Remember that? So I need to subtract by 6 on both sides. And these cancel out. I wrote a little funny here, but a negative 6 minus 6 is negative 12. So negative 4n equals negative 12. I'm just going to... Negative 4n equals negative 12. So I can solve this mentally as well. Negative 4 times what gives me a negative 12? Negative 4 times a positive 3 gives me a negative 12. So if I were to divide both sides by negative 4, I get a positive 3. N equals 3. Number 49, number 49a, and number 49b are all numbers to the 0 power. Okay, so we have 1 to the 0 power, 5 to the 0 power, and 100 to the 0 power. And how would you simplify that? 1 to the 0 power, like I told you in class, anything to the 0 power is always 1. So I'm just trying to train your brain to remember that. 5 to the 0, zero power equals 1. 100 to the 0 power, guess what, equals 1. Now, why does any number to the zero power equal one? I'm going to expect you guys to write in um, an explanation there. So for number 50, if you will go ahead and write in that box, the rule of dividing exponents. And what I mean by that is, let's take, for example, five to the zero power. And let's just um, remember that there is a rule um, of dividing exponents that says that if you have a number in the numerator and if you have a number um, in the denominator, okay, let's just say they have the same base, they're both um, x, those exponents on those variables are both 1. And the rule of dividing exponents tells me that as long as the base is the same, which is x, then you may subtract the numerator's exponent from the denominator's exponent. So x to the 1 power divided by x to the 1 power equals x to the 1 minus 1, which also equals x to the 0. So if I were to use 5 as my example, let's say 5 to the first power divided by 5 to the first power, power equals, my bases are the same, well it's just 5 divided by 5, and we know that 5 divided by 5 is 1, right? We know that 5 divided by 5 is 1, oops. But the rule of dividing exponents tells me that I can take my, if my bases are the same, okay, I can subtract the numerator's exponent from the new, uh, denominator's exponent. 5 to the 5 minus 1 equals 5 to the 0. And all of these equal each other. So 5 to the 0 also equals 1. Hopefully that makes sense. So I will um, accept the rule of dividing exponents. Okay? And also, if you just remember this example, or even this example, and you want to throw that in the box, I'll accept that as well.
numbers 51 through 55, you will be graphing each point in the same coordinate plane. Just remember that a plane in math um, is not like one that flies in the air, but it's a flat surface. So they're talking about this flat piece of paper. You're going to plot the points on this plane, this flat two-dimensional surface. I pulled up this picture here, see if it'll come up where, I don't know if you can see it that well. There we go. But you can see that there is a plane, there are two planes here. There is a Y plane, you can see this Y up here, and then there's a Z plane. These are cross, they're cross-sectioned. And there's a plane that's labeled Z, and it's going horizontal, and then there's a the Y plane, it's going kind of vertical here, at least in our view. So that's what they're talking about plane. And so here you just have a grid that's on a fl on this plane, it's a flat plane. So um, 51 to 55, we are gonna be plotting these relations. The relation is negative three and four. So this point can be called point A or relation A. And remember that you have your y-axis and it goes vertically, and you have your x-axis, it goes horizontally. And your x-axis is going to um, meet up with your y-axis, depending on where it's at. Remember, the first number is your x-coordinate, your second number is your y-coordinate, and same for the others. So let's plot our first point. We have negative three as x, so let's go to our negative three on our x-axis, and then positive four, so we're gonna go up four, one, two, three, four, and that's going to be our negative three, positive four coordinate. You don't have to, don't actually label it three, four, you can, or negative three, four, just go ahead and label it point A or relation A, okay? Um, 52, so let's motor through these next ones. Seven, eight, so remember X is seven, Y is eight, so seven on our X axis and then eight up, eight tick marks up, tick marks up, and that's B. Looks like my pen's running out. Great. 53, C. Negative 2 on our x axis and negative 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, down. S point C. 54, D. Positive 6, negative 7. So positive 6 on our x axis and then negative 7. So you see what I've done here is I've put a point at least for now, in each quadrant. Quadrant one, two, three, and four. And this last one, um, two, zero. Our x is two, our y is zero. So two, and then it doesn't rise at all because there's no uh, y, well, zero is the y coordinate. So that would be e. 56 says give the domain and range of the following relations. Just remember that the domain are all your x coordinates and your range are your all y coordinates. So I'm going to go ahead and circle all my x coordinates so I don't get them confused. And then I'm going to list them here in order. So 0, 4, 5, 8. My range are all my y coordinates. So 7, negative 6, 1, and 2. And list them in order. So negative 6. One, two, seven. Moving on, 57. Again, they want the domain and range. This time, um, they're trying to trick you here. So I'm gonna go ahead and circle all of my X coordinates, which are my domain. And if you notice here, um, let's see here. Well, they're not trying to trick you actually. So just go ahead and list them in order. Negative three, negative two, zero, one, four. Actually, they are 
in order for you already. That was accidental on my part. But anyway, so Y17127. Oh, here's where I tried to trick you. Yeah. So if you notice here, 17127, the 7s repeat, right? And then the 1s repeat. So you'll only need to list them one time. So in order, let's let's cancel out one of our ones and one of our sevens. So all that's left is one, two, and seven. Numbers 58 and 59, you're going to graph the relations. So again, making sure to not confuse your X and Y coordinate. X are the first coordinate and then Y are the second coordinates in these parentheses here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start plotting our points. We have four on our X axis and Y and two on our Y axis, so four, two. So I'm gonna go four to the right, two up. Next we have negative three, one. So we're gonna go negative three on our X axis and one on our Y axis, one up. Remember, Y axis is here, X axis is horizontal, Y axis is vertical. Zero, five. So zero X, five on my Y axis. Six, negative two. So positive six, negative two. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and graph my relation here. So I'm gonna remember, where did I start? So four, two. So here's my four, two. I might even, at this point, write out my my ordered pairs, zero, five, and then six, negative two, and four, no, this is negative three and one. And if you remember, we, um, I gave you guys, when I watched Sarah at her max performance, so I went out to Plymouth at, at um, first, or no, at Fourth Baptist Church, and I had to leave you guys, and um, you had a sub, Miss Patterson sub, and you got this little project. You got the little kite project. You guys remember that? And so you had these ordered pairs to follow, and then you guys drew these beautiful kites. Remember? You guys were so artistic, and I was so proud of you guys. I still have these. They look great. Anyway. And so you, what you guys did was you followed a ordered pair pattern, and that's what you're gonna do here. So you start at four, two, so start at four, two, you went to negative three, one, so you're gonna draw your line there. And then you went to zero, five, so draw your next line there. And then six, negative two, so you're gonna draw that line there. Oops, you know what I mean. Try to draw it a little straighter than I did. So that's your first, um, relation okay next we have four negative four three negative three two negative two one negative one see the pattern there so um let's zoom in a little bit brighten it up and so let's let's go from there so four negative four three negative three two negative two one negative one and that is just going to be a straight line Number 60 and 61 ask, determine from the set of ordered pairs whether the relations are functions. Remember that a function cannot, if it's a function, it cannot have two of the same x coordinates. So I'm going to circle my x coordinates here, and I see that my x coordinates here are both five. So no, it is not a function. How about this set of ordered pairs over here? We have negative three, four, seven, and negative one. They're all unique. There are none that are the same. So yes, it is a function.
four numbers, 62 to 64, we have some functions here. And our equation is the function of x equals 5x minus 2. You're going to use this equation for each problem. So I'm just going to go ahead and write that out. Function of x equals fx minus 2. I'll write it out for this one too. When you're working with functions, you are going to be substituting your value of your function. So here our function of x is 3. Here our function of x is 9. And our function of x equals negative 1 for this one. So every time you see that x is when you're going to value or um, substitute your 3. So let me show you. So you can change this to your function of x equals 3. And you're going to substitute every time you see x with 3. 15 minus 2, 13. 63, same thing. So our function of x is 9. So we'll substitute 9 there. And every time you see x, you'll substitute 9. So 5 times 9 is 45, minus 2, function of 9 is 43. Negative 1 is our function of x, oops, so 5 times a negative 1 minus 2. 5 times a negative 1 is a negative 5 minus 2. Negative 7, because a negative 5 minus 2 is a negative 7. Remember, same signs, add and keep the sign. 65 says, using the slope formula, find the slope of the line through the two given points. So you need to know the slope formula, and that is m equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. From here, you're going to substitute, well, first let's label our coordinates here. Our 2 is our x1, our 8 is our y1, our negative 1 is our x2, because it's our second x, and then our y is, our y2 is 3. Make sense? Now we're just going to substitute our values in where we see in our formula. So m equals y2. I like to kind of circle one, um, one either x or y, so I don't get them confused. So in this case, I'll, I've circled my y's. So y2, here's my y2. That is y2 minus y1, 3 minus 8. And how about my x coordinates? x2 is a negative 1, and my x1 is 2. But we're going to subtract, see, minus, minus 2. In my numerator, I have a negative 5. In my denominator, I have a negative 3. A negative divided by a negative is a positive, so I end up getting my slope at 5 over 3. Rise over run, rise is 5, run is 3. Number 66, I went ahead and wrote out the, the slope formula. Now I just need to plug in, I'm going to circle my y's. y2 is 2, y1 is a negative 3. So I have to subtract, but I have to subtract a negative 3. Then x2 is 5 minus x1, which is 7. 2 minus a negative 3 is like writing 2 plus 3, because a negative into a negative is a positive. And then 5 minus 7 is negative 2. And then we have 5 over a negative 2. So our slope is negative 5, 2. 67 and 68, find the x and y intercepts of the following lines. 
this is when you're going to, I suggest you write out twice this equation. And for each equation, you're going to set your x at zero to figure out what y is. And in this equation, you're gonna set your y at zero to figure out what x is. So I'll explain that. So three, we're gonna set our x to zero. Three times zero minus y equals nine. This one I'm gonna set my y to zero to figure out what x is. So let's solve this equation first to figure out y. Three times zero is zero, so I'm left with negative y equals nine. And if you do the um, division there, y equals negative nine. This one, 3x minus zero is nine. 3x equals nine, x equals three. The zero drops off, 3x equals nine. Divide through, three times what is nine, x um, three times three is nine. So I now have my x and y coordinate. So my x is three and my y is a negative nine. Same with 68, I suggest writing that equation out twice and setting your x to zero on one equation and then setting your y to zero on the other equation. So you see here I set my x to zero on this equation and I set my y to zero on this equation. So let's solve. Four times zero is zero, so I don't need that. Negative two times what equals eight? Neg um, negative four times a negative two gives me a positive eight. Over here, negative two times zero is zero, so that cancels out, so I'm left with negative four x equals eight, and negative four times what is eight? Positive two times four gives me a positive eight. So I now know my, my um, ordered pair here. My x is a two, and my y is a negative four. Put that in parentheses. So for 69 and 70, we're looking at direct variation and just a little bit of a reminder about what that even means. Uh, first, I'll throw up here the, the formula, y equals um, the constant times x. And oops, and if you remember, we just talked about direct variation and some examples might be um, how well or how much you study for a final will directly be um, related to or linked to how well you do on that final. So a lot of times if you don't study for a final, um, especially ones where there's a lot of memorization like history or something like that, and you get an F, then that is directly linked to um, the lack of preparation. Another thing I think of is, um, uh, like say cigarette smoking. If you smoke a lot and you end up with lung cancer, there's a lot of studies that show that smoking is directly linked to lung cancer. And so it's almost a guarantee that you'll get lung cancer. So smoking is directly, um, is a variable when it comes to lung cancer. Um, you can look at a lot of examples. Um, in real life. So uh, maybe you can think of one on your own right now. But anyway, back to um, this problem here. So find the constant if y varies directly with x. We're going to use that formula y equals kx and you're just going to simply plug in your values. So y equals 8. We don't know our constant yet. Our x equals 4. So this can be rewritten as 4k equals 8. If you're going to write it properly, you put the variable on the left and then divide through or ask yourself 4 times what equals 8, 4 times 2 equals 8. So, or you can divide through by 4, getting k equals 8 divided by 4, which is 2. So our constant is 2. So y equals 100 when x equals 16. There's the formula there, plug in the values. To write it proper, I'd say, um, I'd put my variable on the left, so k times 16 is 16k equals 100, 
if I divide that through, k equals 